So welcome to another episode of Crap No One Tells You. With me today is Rob Peterman from Big Brothers Big Sisters. Thank you for having me. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the crap no one tells you about growing up without a mentor. Yeah. So let's just dive right in. What is some of the crap no one tells you of growing up without a mentor? Um, not having a mentor makes things a lot harder. <laughs> Found that out the hard way. Uh, I, I came from a really great home where I had really good parents and everything, but um, I really was left kind of trying to figure everything out on my own, especially, you know, after high school, wasn't really sure, you know, what I was good at or anything. Um, had a lot of trial and error. My first two years of college, I was kind of, you know, bouncing around. I, I wasn't matriculated in as a undergrad, I, I had to take three classes that they just kind of threw me in and they're like, prove to us that you belong here. I had to get a certain GPA. You know, I was taking like history of Atlantic Ocean and uh, <laughs> okay. an acting class and all this stuff. And, you know, during that time, I, I thought that I wanted to teach history and that kind of fell apart. Uh, I moved on to psychology, didn't like that. And then I landed at elementary ed, but my GPA at one point was a 2.7. I was failing a lot of classes. I was had, had to retake a lot. And at one point, this one advisor from the elementary ed department in my college reached out to me. And she's like, I want you for my major. I see a lot of potential in you. And we're going to work with you. And we're going to turn this boat around. And I had straight A's ever since she reached out to me. She really changed my life. She turned it around. So a teacher kind of saw what you were doing or not doing, I should say. Well, her name <laughs> I, was, was Dr. Prince, and I'm forever grateful for her because she saw potential in me when nobody else did, you know. So how was that, how, how did things change for you at that point? Like, what was, what was the moment you realized that this is not the type of relationship I'm used to having with someone? Um, so, I mean, prior to meeting Dr. Prince, as early as third grade, I had, you know, teachers call me stupid, I had that happen again in, in high school, and, you know, I just... I'm also a twin, so that constant comparison and everything growing up and not hearing the same things that, you know, my twin was hearing was tough. And to finally have a, a Dr. Prince say those things to me meant a lot, and it, it motivated me. It changed my whole path. So, um, you know, and that's really what Big Brothers Big Sisters is all about, just having even just one voice. Is that kind of what got you into working with Big Brothers Big Sisters? Is yeah. having had that experience yourself, kind of? Yeah, so... Ever since then, I really wanted to just be able to give back and be the voice, you know, that, you know, other people may need and that I needed growing up because I made it a, a mission to make sure that people didn't feel the way that I felt during that time because, you know, I was at some pretty low points. I was really stuck. Um, so, yeah, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, you know, when I saw an opening there, I was like, wow, that's literally what I'm, you know, all about. That's something that really gravitated towards me. So how long have you been with Big Brothers Big Sisters now? This will be my fourth year. So that's a while. It is, yeah. <laughs> and you're going to school full time, right? Yeah, and I'm going to grad school to uh, be a clinical mental health therapist. So Okay. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about the um, Big Brothers Big Sister organization. Like, what is it about? What do you guys do? Um, who needs it? Who should be involved? Yeah, I <laughs> like, mean... Endless questions. <laughs> so Big Brothers Big Sisters is a... Uh, a uh, nationally known nonprofit organization that's a, a peer to peer mentoring organization. So, uh, specifically in Bucks County. Uh, okay, so let's hold on, let's dumb yeah. it down. Okay, peer to peer mentor organization. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly does that mean? Uh, so, it's one to one. So, our littles that get referred to us or we reach out to are between the ages of seven to 14. Um, to be a big brother or big sister, uh, you have to be 18 or older. Okay, so basically you guys find kids, 7 to 14, mm -hmm. that are lacking a mentor or someone in their life, and then you try to pair it with someone that's 18 plus that would be a good mentor for that child. Right. Kid. Um, so we typically get kids referred to us by a parent, uh, a teacher, a guidance counselor, um, and then what we'll do is we'll do an interview with the child, um, we'll kind of get their, their interests, what their needs may be. And uh, our match support team also does the same thing with potential bigs. So say if you came to our agency and said that you wanted to be a big brother, we would do our background checks and also interview you as well and get your common interests and where you think your strengths are. And we'd try to match you with a little brother who we think you'd be most compatible with. 
Okay. It sounds like a complicated process. It, it, it sounds like <laughs> it, but it's actually, it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, dating in a way. You're right. trying to find that perfect partner, perfect match. Um, and a perfect example of that is our past board president is uh, a former little brother. And he's still connected to his former big brother for over 40 years. I think he says he still consults with him on adult decisions. Wow. Yeah. So like so no. this is not, well, I'm, I'm guessing it can be someone goes in, does it for a year and then, you know, it doesn't work, whatever, whatever. But there are apparently stories where this becomes like a lifelong bond then. Yeah. So they ask for a 15 month commitment. Okay. with the match and they uh, the requirement is to see them twice a month um and we do hold uh match activities as well where you know it's it's easy for you to get involved and come out go to sky zone or do uh mini golf anything of that nature you know it, it doesn't have to be this extravagant hangout every time you see them it could uh be simply just throwing the football with them or or doing their homework helping them do their homework letting yeah. them come over get in the pool well, have a chat <laughs> it could be something <laughs> super simple like that you know right. um so yeah, I mean, the the minimum we ask for is for a 15 month commitment, but there are several occasions where we see that last longer than that. And sometimes, you know, in, in the instance of our former president, you know, almost a lifetime. So. so this can be truly life changing for, well, for both parties, I would think. Yeah. So we've had a lot of big brothers and sisters tell us how fulfilling it is to them as well, you know, especially... Um, if you're a parent and your, your child has just gone off to college, you, you feel that empty nest, you, you, you're trying to find out like a purpose and way to give back as well. Um, it's really rejuvenating for the big as also, you know, um, cause you still have a lot to give. You have so much experience. You have all this advice that you can instill on, you know, the vulnerable youth in our community. So I'm assuming that it's, it's a lot of the like, what is the criteria for someone that gets into the program as a little? I'm assuming you guys have certain guidelines that, you know, you're not just randomly taking any kid, right? Like, there has to be criteria. So what what is some of that criteria that... Yeah, so the the kids that come into our program are deemed vulnerable youth. So that could be anything where, you know, they're either getting in trouble in school, they're, they're coming up from some, some challenges at home. Um, you know, a multitude of, of obstacles that they might be facing. Um, those are really the youth that we're trying to reach out to the most because they're the ones that need us the most. So it's what we used to call the troubled kids. Well, yes. But, um, <laughs> I know we can't say that anymore, guess, yeah, but, yeah. Right? <laughs> but for people that are Gen X and older, like that's now, it's just a new term for what we used to think of as those kids. And most of us that grew up as with that definition, myself included, mm -hmm. I was always the troubled kid at school. <laughs> um, we really know that it's not, a lot of times it has nothing to do with us being those types of kids. It's lack of the environment around us sometimes, or like it's, it's not just us. It's sometimes the lack of someone to talk to. Right. That and, you know, some of the kids also just don't have the resources needed to uh, help them reach their fullest potential. And that's also something that we work with them on and build so community. What do you mean with. by not having the resources? Um, something as simple as, you know, when the pandemic happened, it was so easy for a lot of us to be able to just pop on Zoom and, you know, continue our daily lives that way a lot of kids might not have, you know, internet connection at home or they might not have the laptops or um, the resources like that to be able to continue that. So um, that's something that we try to uh, accommodate them with as well. Um, for example, the Big Brothers Big Sisters chapter in Lehigh Valley, they have a whole computer room where kids can come after school to do their homework and um, just utilize the resources that, resources that they have on their premise there. So when you say resources, it's literally everything. Everything that they need, yeah. And that's something that we're trying to do as well in our Bucks County chapter. Okay. So um, more about the bigs. Yeah. What's needed to become a big? What's needed to become a big is... And what is, type of person should become a big? Let's talk about that too. Yeah, well, obviously, <laughs> you know, we, we do our background checks and we have to do our due diligence that way. We want to make sure since we are... Um, a nonprofit organization that helps youth uh, that we are providing them with, you know, a safe adult. Um, 
really right now the strong need is for male bigs. We have a lot of young boys on our wait list and we try to match um, a big brother to a little brother and do boy to boy, girl to girl, just because, um, you know, for safety reasons. But mm -hmm. also we feel like that's where the strongest connections happen. Um, so yeah, if there's any males out there, <laughs> we need male bigs. Okay. So who should consider becoming a male big? Anybody that's over the age of 18 and you feel like you have the time and the, you know, energy and you have um, a lot to give back, you know, that could be any kind of skill, you know, life skill. You, you feel like you have that, you know, fire within you to want to, you know, and that passion to be able to want to help somebody else. Okay. So let's talk about the organization itself a little bit. Yeah. You guys have been around for a while as an organization in, so let the Bucks County specific one, right? So how long has that one been around? So that one's been around since the 1960s. Um, if you haven't seen our building, it's a 200 year old <laughs> farmhouse and it is exactly how it sounds. It looks, um, might not be pretty from the outside, but there's definitely a lot of, you know, good things going on on the inside. Okay. <laughs> and how do you guys get funded? I mean, is this, are there government grants? Is this all like fundraising is? Yeah. So each, uh, so Big Brothers Big Sisters is uh, a nationally known uh, organization and Big Brothers Big Sisters of America is down in Tampa Bay, but each individual chapter is uh, responsible for, you know, getting most of their funds. So we do that through grants and we also do that through our, our fundraising events that we have throughout the year. Okay. Local businesses get involved, all of that stuff. Local businesses, all the way down to uh, your mom and pop coffee shop. So we, we kind of see it all. And, um, you know, every donation goes a huge way. So even if you're that local mom and pop business shop who just donates gift certificates, we use that for our raffle baskets and that goes a long way as well. So, okay. So, um, I want to get back to you for a little bit yeah. because I find your story interesting. So when you were growing up, were you aware that most or many people have this mentor relationship with other people that kind of guide them through things in a positive way? Yes and no. Um, you know, the, the, the two people that I looked up to the most uh, and always went to for advice were, were my dad and my grandpa, just because, you know, those are the two that I aspired to be. Um, outside of that, you know, I would say no. I didn't know that there were these like mentoring organizations. I didn't know that, you know, those resources were really available. Coaches are supposed to help you out and yeah, like teachers and there's all these people out there that you can get mentorship from. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've been on some sports teams and everything and I had some really great coaches and I, you know, I've also had some that, you know, just cared more about, you know, winning and, you know, especially at a young age, that's not necessarily, you know, everything, but. So, um, what's your favorite part about working within big brothers, big sisters? Just hearing the success stories, you know, there, we, uh, a couple months ago, we had one of our first littles get accepted into an Ivy League school, Princeton University, and that's a huge success story. You know, that's some something that we're really proud to to talk about and share, and you know, to see that firsthand and hear that they're doing really well. It's that's what it's all about. You know. So how how good is the? Like, so here's the the hard part, right? Is how do you define a success rate, right? Like. What, what is the definition of success for someone that might be struggling and gets a little bit of guidance and things become slightly better for them, right? Like, what's the definition of success for you guys? Because that, that, yes, is a success story, but that's a really big one, yeah. right? Like, but there's all these little victories that, that must be happening all the time. Right. And that's something that we try to celebrate as well. So obviously the Princeton University one's a big one, but we live by the 1% better each day motto, you know? So if a kid was failing in school and they improved that F to a D, that's 1% better. That's a success story. Um, little baby steps help you get to where you want to be. And, you know, from the beginning of the, of the match to that 15 month later, um, if there was any growth at all, that's a success story. Um, so guess what? It's nice to have these kids get into Ivy League schools. <laughs> that's, uh, but at the end of the day, that I don't think that matters as much as like one kid excelling to getting to Ivy League. Mm -hmm. I, I would rather take 10 kids that improve 
from I don't know Fs to Bs yeah. over the course of a year. Exactly. So how many how many kids do you guys actually service any given year? So right now we're still you know picking the program back up post COVID. So I think we're around seventy matches that we serve um, in our um, peer to peer mentoring. Um, and is there a wait list? We do have a wait list. Um, I'm unsure of how many are on the wait list, but I know most of them are boys. Probably about seventy percent of them are boys. Um, but we, uh, I'm I'm the marketing and events manager, so I don't know the. Uh, no, no, no. The you, you don't need to know details, yeah. right? Like, but it it. So you're currently serving seventy, and there is a wait list on top of it. Right. Um, so we also hold and, these programs right now called a little time, where if you are even a little bit interested in becoming a big brother or big sisters. We have these outings, like we just did one two weeks ago at Nishamni Brewing Company, where you could come out, meet big brothers and big sisters who are a part of our agency right now, and meet the staff and learn more about the agency and learn more about what it would look like for you and ask questions and kind of mingle. And do other organizations, the other big brothers, big sisters have similar type of events? So if someone's listening to this in California, and gets intrigued, they can call their local Big Brothers Big Sisters and see, like, what what do you have available? I'm unsure if other Big Brothers Big Sisters chapters have that, um, but it's definitely something that we recommend because we had a really nice turnout uh, two weeks ago, and we have a lot of prospective bigs that came from that. Um, so um, that's the type of event where if you're unsure whether it's a right fit for you to be a big, you get mm -hmm. to talk to other bigs, adults. Right. <laughs> To see like what their experience has been, how they liked it, and all of that stuff. Exactly, because um, <clears throat> it is it is a big commitment. You know, um, a lot of people out there. I know. You know, I was asked to be Big Brother too, and my answer was, you know, I'm in my 20s and I'm still figuring myself out. I, you know, I don't have time. Um, that's what we hear a lot. But when you come out to these meetings, you you hear and realize like I do have time. I can do, dedicate an hour to a month to just meet with these kids and grab a drink or get a burger and something like that, you know? Um, so have you done it or are you not allowed to be a big as part of the organization? I haven't done it just yet. And I'm <laughs> okay. sure if my uh, program director is hearing this, she'll reach out to me again and see if I could do it. Okay. You know. Are there any rules against staff being? No, in? there's not. We, okay. we actually had a couple staff um, that were either big sisters or big brothers in the okay. past. And, uh, you know, that's, it, that's what we want. We we know what the mission's all about, and we uh, we we would make really good bigs. So. so I remember I visited the organization, your guys specifically, probably like five or six years ago, and in that old farmhouse where you have to bend down to go through every door. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I was talking to a lady there, and there was one thing that she said that I didn't even cross my mind, and she was. We desperately need more bi or trilingual bigs because yeah. there are kids that, yes, they may speak English as a second language, but they struggle bonding in that language, mm -hmm. which was quite fascinating to me. Like, and, you know, it's no secret we're in white suburbia, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there is very little diversity in the area we're in. So, a lot of times I don't think people think about that, but is there a need for people with more diverse backgrounds to start looking at this and saying, hey, we need to get involved? Absolutely. Um, even if you think back and look at people that you looked up to as a kid, um, just seeing someone who is similar to you validates you and it, it motivates you. Example, uh, someone that I looked up to growing up was Allen Iverson. I was a short kid playing basketball <laughs> and you know, he, he, he was somebody that was just like me. He was short, he was fast. And I was like, wow, I really relate to this guy. He's motivating me. He's achieving on a high level. So having those diverse backgrounds where you have someone who's bilingual, you, you have a little kid and they're like, wow, this person validates me. They understand me. They get me. Um, that could be very powerful for a youth. Um, so yeah, any... Do you guys have a lot of people that have immigrated to this country that actually come in to be bigs? I'm actually unsure of that answer, but... Okay. Um, I, it was just a thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, because um, I remember hearing a story from someone that's actually, I believe he was involved with your organization a while ago, that um, I think he was a Polish immigrant, um, his parents spoke very little English, 
So he always struggled and all that stuff and eventually ended up with Big Brothers Big Sisters and got a got a sign with a match mm -hmm. that was like I don't know, he was like a lawyer or a judge or something and he was the one that helped him through school. He was the one that helped him with his English. He was the one that turned him from that kid that wasn't going anywhere to becoming an extremely successful business owner. And I'm fascinated because he still tells that story and it's got to be at least 30 years ago that this... Yeah. Um, but it's, it's interesting, you know, I just was one of those things where... Because I know... It, people that have moved here that have parents that really don't speak that much English, mm -hmm. right? So being a kid, English as a second language can't be easy. No, it's, it's probably extremely difficult. And uh, like I said, just having that representation and having that resource to be able to, um, you know, communicate with them and have somebody that validates them. It's, it's very powerful for, for them to be able to see that and to, um, to have that person in their life. So what do the future hold for you? <laughs> for me? Well, I mean, I'll be moving on, hopefully uh, graduating grad school um, in within the next year. And uh, yeah, doing so this. So what did you end you? Because you said earlier on that it was, uh, she was elementary ed. Dr. Yeah, Prince. Dr. That's, Prince was an elementary ed. Is that uh, where you ended up? I ended up uh, being an elementary ed major. I student taught for a little bit, and then my uh, senior year, after I did my student teaching, I, I landed at Make a Wish Foundation as a wish grantor. Oh wow! So I uh, granted wishes to kids who had critical illnesses, and that was very impactful. That kind of set me on this uh, this path to get involved in nonprofits and ultimately now in, uh, to mental health to, uh, to continue to help people. So what will you be graduating with? I will be, I'll be gra graduating with uh, an LPC, be a licensed professional counselor. Wow. Yeah. So now you're going to be on the really deep end of that spectrum. Yeah. I, I hope that I can uh, be a Dr. Prince to, to somebody else, you know. So you're, you would get the best of both worlds. Yeah. You get to help them professionally and... You know, I'm, you're, I'm sure your director's going to hold you to it. And then you're going to be a big, of course. Of course. Down the line, you know, I'll come back and be a big brother to, uh, to somebody here in Bucks County. So, so what are, um, just to, to kind of wrap up the organization a little bit, if you had to prioritize, what, does, what do these types of organizations really need right now? Do they need people? Do they need funds? Do they need everything? Do they need a... Pat on the back, like <laughs> <laughs> pat on the backs are always <laughs> accepted. Uh, so something that we always talk about when we go out into the community is we understand that people are able to give either talent, treasure, or time, and that's all we can ask for. Um, some people may be at a point of their life where they might not be able to give time. They can give you treasure. Or they can give you talent. Um, we have a lot of board members who are able to give us talent. Um, you know, it's so we never push anything we always just present to them where the areas of need are and all three of them are areas of need you know we always need um, support and volunteers to either be a part of our organization as bigs to help out at fundraising events um, you know we always need um, treasure you know help us with supporting these programs um, and you know we also you know need people to help dedicate their time as well okay. are there other things other than like someone writing a check that some of these organizations may need that some of us could be overlooking. Like you just said earlier that some of these kids don't even have laptops. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I go through a new laptop every two <laughs> years because <laughs> like, I, that's just what I do. Yeah. I, my laptops, it's a rule cause I had one crash on me <laughs> and I'm like <laughs> now every two years, regardless of the condition of that laptop, it gets recycled and then they end up sitting You'll see a few laptops yeah, sitting looking, around on I'm shelves. Looking at one right now. <laughs> right. <on a> shelf. <laughs> so, like, is that type of stuff something that I could bring to you guys and be like, "Here, give this to a kid that needs it"? Or yeah, those those are things that obviously we would we would love to accept. Other things that people might not think about is we also do um, classes where we teach kids how to cook, how to do life skills. So, if there are you know 
mom and pop shops, like local community colleges, anybody out there who's willing to help teach kids how to, to cook, you know, how to do their laundry, stuff like that. Where So like if you own a restaurant and you want to do a cooking yeah. class for kids, just teach them how to make, I don't know, pasta. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. You that's, should approach your local big brothers, big sisters and say like, hey, I'm. I'm willing to do this. Yeah. Like right now we're partnering with the church and uh, this past Monday we uh, utilized their kitchen to be able to make soups and other and chili and other food. Um, we taught the kids how to do it and then we end up donating that food to um, like Christ Home or other like area like other nonprofits that might need it, you know. So it's it's great to be able to teach the kids these skills. We also have a garden um, at our, uh, facility and we have, you know, you know, landscapers come out, teach the kids how to, uh, properly, you know, grow these, uh, vegetables and grow the flowers. And like I said, uh, before with the food, um, the flowers we end up growing, picking, and then we also donate those to, um, um, people who are in nur nursing homes. So, uh, it's a way for the kids to learn the skill, but also learn how to use that skill to give back to the community and return the fever. So it's not just about the the bigs and the littles and that one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's the organization really is looking to teach kids life skills right. in general. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some, some things that they might not be able to get at school. Um, the yeah, no, nobody at school teaches you how to balance a checkbook yeah. or understand, yeah. <laughs> you know, basic things. They don't barely show you how to boil an egg. Yeah, no, I, it took me a <laughs> very long time to learn how to uh, crack an egg, let alone boil it. Um, <laughs> Also balancing checkbooks, that, that's something I had to learn older as well. So <laughs> any life skill um, that you have um, or feel like you can provide to the kids is also something that can really go a long way. Um, so, when you, so just to kind of wrap this up and go full circle. So if you want to be a big, it's not about taking them to Disney World. It's right. about bringing them to your house and cooking a meal with them. Like it could be something as simple as that. Yeah. Having a conversation, cooking a meal, sitting down, having a conversation, how, bringing them out, showing them how to mow the lawn. Yeah. Right. Like ba we're talking basic things that. Anything that's, you know, it, a lot of people can get intimidated by being asked to volunteer. Um, it's not as scary as it sounds. It's, it's stuff that you, it, it almost sounds like the stuff that I'm already doing for my little cousins. Exactly. Right. Like yeah. they come over to my house on a weekend and I'm like, okay, let's get to work. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. And they love it. And well, they love some of it. So yeah, some. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of them that she loves cooking. If we're making ribs, everything else. Wow. Making ribs. Yeah. That's really impressive. So we taught her, I taught her how to operate the smoker and prep the ribs and, it's a six hour cook time, so or seven hour cook time, so it's patience. It's you know, but she absolutely loves coming over and rather than sitting on her phone for yeah, six hours, she actually gets to do stuff. And see, she might end up well, she enjoys that, but what if she ends up becoming, you know, a chef? That's something that you instilled in her and you inspired her to she actually learn that is skill. she's fourteen years old and has a side business making um, decorative cupcakes for birthday parties. Wow, see, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so it uh, a lot of times it doesn't take much to inspire someone to do things. Mm -hmm. But um, you just have to believe in them and it, give them the time and the patience. Correct. And yeah. walk them through the basic things. And once they get inspired, it's amazing what what they will do, especially as kids. Oh yeah. All right. That I'm trying to remember like 12, 13. Actually, I think I was 11 when I started my first that I can now look back and say it was my first entrepreneurial venture, which was going to the local golf course and collecting golf balls in the woods and from water. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, I would sit outside the clubhouse or on the first tee and sell the golf balls wow. back to the golfers. <laughs> that's impressive. And that's how I actually ended up playing golf. Um, <laughs> I ended up selling golf balls to my neighbor that recognized me and gave me my first golf club because he's like, well, you have the balls. Do you have something to hit it with? <laughs> the question is, are you a good golfer now? Uh, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> used to be single digit handicaps not anymore no okay. just been too busy to play but yeah and, but once again that's a story of how someone saw me on a golf course and a single golf club ignited me i ended up being um it's gonna sound like bragging but i actually ended up being one of three teen players at my golf course that was offered free winter training with a club because i was playing 
in the com the teen com so the competitions there are not school based they're all private mm -hmm. so they i was one of three kids at the time that got offered to play through winter training so that i could compete for the club the following summer so that's amazing though you should brag about that <laughs> well you worked hard to get to that point well yeah. yeah it was it was but it all started because you know some guy a neighbor handed me a golf club and he was actually the first guy to show me how to swing the club and and it's a neighbor and i can't even tell you his name like i i don't i remember him i remember spending time with him i remember these basics um but i couldn't tell you any details about him but he had a drastic impact on on my life. Now that I'm thinking back at it, I'm like, wow. And then how many deals have I done on a golf course? Like <laughs> that moment of him handing me a golf club like has, a, has this compounding effect throughout my life, I guess. It's, right? This, it's stuff, a, this stuff makes you think. It's a butterfly effect almost. Right. Yeah. And if he's out there listening, come you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. hit up Gummy. <laughs> he's actually in Denmark, but um, <laughs> yeah, I guess my episodes get listened to in Denmark. <laughs> but um, well, thank you for coming in. Thank you, Pat. Um, one last piece of advice for anyone that's looking to become a big, how long should they wait before applying or talking to someone? So before you make any decision, um, you know, as important as this, definitely you think it over and reach out to us, ask questions. You know, we're, we're here to help and, you know, we're not here to force your hand, but um, think it over. It, it takes probably, a, you know, a couple of weeks to like a month for us to do all the background checks in the interview. Um, but after that, you know, you'll be on your way and you won't feel alone throughout the match. We do have a match support team who's there to, to help you, guide you, give you any tickets that we get donated or answer any questions if you uh, are feeling stuck. So um, it, it, it takes a village to, to raise uh, a kid or to support a kid. And, you know, we, we have your back. We are that village. So one last question. I know I said I was going to wrap it up. If you happen to be in the age range of being a little, and you think this is something you would like to try, how do you, as a little, get in touch with the organization or, or do you have to go through an intermediary? That's a great question. So you can, the little can also refer themselves. So you can go to our website, bbbsbc.org. So three Bs, um, sbc.org, bbbsbc.org. That's for the Bucks County one. For the Bucks County yes. one. Um, if you're out there in another state, I would go to uh, the Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America website uh, to try to find your local chapter. And then as a little, you can do the same thing. Call in, ask questions, fill out the form. Call in, ask questions, fill out the form. Um, and then a representative from your local chapter will get back in touch with, with you, a guardian or a loved one, and see how uh, you know they could be of best assistance to you. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Thanks for having me.